So all the kids are making their way out. Good morning. morning. How are you all doing this morning? Pretty good? Good. So all of us, whether we admit it or not, we want to belong. All of us have this inner inkling, like this inner desire to say, those are my people, or I'm part of this family. And when we're younger, we sometimes do crazy, ridiculous things. I mean, we change the color of our hair, thinking people will like us better. We change the color of our clothes. We pretend to like things that we absolutely hate, all so that we could simply fit in somewhere. I remember, I'll admit this to you all because I know you're a graceful people, but uh, when I was in seventh grade, I wore these things called Jinko jeans. They were these super baggy, ridiculous looking things, and I pretended to be a skater which, if you don't know me, I'm not flexible. I'm not agile. Skating is not my thing. But I pretended simply so some neighborhood kids would like me. But while that's funny when we're kids, when we get older, we do the same thing. It just looks a little more respectable. Even within a church, you know, we're a First Baptist church. Not so sure about Second Baptist, but we know who we are. We're us, right? But what Paul is saying in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, which is the text we're going to look at, he's talking to the Ephesian Christians, and he's encouraging them that Jesus has taken and completely destroyed the dividing line that separated them as Gentiles from the people of God. And what I hope we get from this passage this morning is that because of Jesus, the church can be a place for all people. So let's read Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 together. If you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's 815. And if you don't have a Bible at home, take that Bible home with you. That's our gift to you. So Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, it reads, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called to uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. So this is God's word for us this morning. Um, Let's pray. Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit illuminate our hearts and minds this morning. Help us to see through your word who you are, to know you better, and help us to see your work in our lives. Please, Lord, show us how we can live in such a way that serves others, encourages each other, and brings you glory. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. So in verses 11 through 12, and in case you didn't notice, I'm reading from the ESV. It's a little different than the NIV, but not different enough that's going to cause any trouble here. So in verses 11 through 12, Paul opens up this passage reminding the Christians in Ephesus of who they were before they placed their faith in Christ. And not just who they were in relation to God, but who they were before Christ in relation to God's people. That's the distinction between Jew and Gentile. The Jewish people were God's chosen people. 
They were chosen by God to be a light to the nations through whom the Messiah would come and then be a blessing to all the nations. The Gentiles were everyone else. So look at me again real quick at Ephesians 2, 11 through 12. It says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Paul is reminding the Ephesians that as Gentiles, apart from Christ, they were missing out on the blessings that came from having a relationship with God. But not only that, they were missing out on the blessings that came from being part of the people of God. And they are also missing out on the direct blessings of the promises of God. And we see in verse 12 that it leaves them without hope and without God. I mean, that's a pretty dismal place to be. They were hopeless. And not only were they hopeless, but they were powerless to change their situation. The only thing I could think of, kind of uh, with a similar uh, comparison, are orphans in an orphanage. I heard this story about this couple who went to Russia and they were visiting these orphanages in order to adopt a child. And what they said is that when they walked into these orphanages, so many times the kids, they wouldn't even look up at them. The ones who had been there a while, they knew. They had seen families come. They had seen families go. They're not stupid. They know the older they get, they're less likely to be adopted. And they said they saw these kids, and these kids just sat there without hope. There was nothing that those kids could do to change their situation. It was going to take someone from outside come in on their own volition and adopt them before they would be able to be called son or daughter. And for the Gentiles, it's the same way. It's, it was Paul is saying, you as Gentiles, it's going to take someone from outside to come in and change your situation, your predicament. And while on the surface, we may not seem as desperate as orphans, the reality is, is that apart from Jesus, our internal struggles, our tendencies, our sin, it holds us in bondage and slavery, separated from God. And it also holds us in bondage and slavery, separated from fellowship in the community of God. But as we continue reading, starting in verse 13, we're going to see that the church is a place for all people because Jesus has removed the barrier that separated us and God. So verses 13 through the first part of 14 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one. So we see here that in Jesus, when Jesus died for one's sins, he made it possible that as one places their faith in Christ, that they're brought into a close relationship with God. Here Paul is saying that God has now created a new people for himself. And this new people are the Christians. And this new community is the church. So through Jesus, the community of God is no longer determined by physical lineage. It's not determined by where you worship or where you're from. But it's determined by the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. It's determined by them being regenerated, by one placing their faith in Jesus and being spiritually changed. So kind of Jew and Gentile coming together to make Christian, in my mind, is kind of like a marriage. Before people are married, you have two individuals. They have their own experiences, their own characteristics. I mean, they're themselves. But when they come into covenant relationship with each other, all of a sudden there's this new category. There's this married couple. And just like the church, while those individuals don't lose their individuality, God made them unique. They don't become less of what they were. But when they're joined together, they, be they become something more. And it's only as we are brought into relationship with God that we then can start to truly be in relationship with other people. And think about that real quick, because I, I don't want to miss this point. 
think like about the prodigal son. Um, it's in Luke 15, so if you're taking notes, you could write that down as a reference. But he tells his father and his family, you know, forget you all. I want out. I want to go spend my money, live my life how I want, and how I want that done is without you. And he tells his dad, you can't die fast enough. Give me my money now. And he goes and he blows it. And we all know he blew it on booze and women. I mean, and he finds himself without money. And shockingly, when his money runs out, his friends run out, and he ends up in this shameful job, desperate for food, looking at the pig food, and like, man, that's starting to look tempting. But the way the wording is, he couldn't even get the pig food. That's the situation that he was in. And so he's like, okay, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to return home and beg that I could be a servant in my father's house. Now, okay, stop there. What if he just said, okay, I'm going to return home, and he sneaks in through the back door, and he's like, okay, I'm not going to talk to my father. I'm just going to pretend like nothing happened. And I'm just going to start joking and laughing with the household and with my brothers and stuff. That wouldn't work. He would, even if he put a big smile on his face and pretended everything was okay, it wouldn't work because he'd still be estranged to his father. But we know, most of us know how the prodigal story goes. The son returns home. The father sees him down the road and runs and greets him and hugs him and loves him and just showers grace and mercy on him. And it's not until that relationship with his father is restored that we even care about what his relationship with everyone else looks like. And so in the same way through Christ, we are reconciled to our Heavenly Father. And it's from that that we're then able to have true, genuine fellowship with everyone else. So as you sit here this morning, you may be questioning if you belong here. You may be thinking, I am way too far gone. I have sinned so much. You may be thinking, you don't know what I've done. Things that I am scared to even say out loud. You may th be thinking, I've hurt way too many people. There's no way that God will accept me or that God would want me to be part of his people, part of his community. If that's you, if you're thinking that, remind yourself of what Jesus did on the cross. Understand that your acceptance, it's not based on you. It's based on what Jesus did on the cross for your sins. And that through him, you're forgiven. And you are reconciled to God. And you were reconciled to others. You can look to the cross. That's why we have it up here. And you can know that because of Jesus, the church is a place for you. Some of you may fully accept that you're forgiven and accepted by God. And for you, and I'm in that group, I think you all have to ask yourself, do I look at others? Are there people who have a certain sin or who act a certain way who I think are outside of God's grace? Are there some situations in your own life where you look at the people and you're like, there is no way they will ever come to Christ? When we do that, we undermine the power of God and his ability to reach and transform lives. Don't ever forget that we have an infinite God who is omnipotent and he specializes in working the miraculous. I know people where if you look at their background and family history, all you see is broken relationships. You see drug abuse, alcohol abuse, physical violence and sexual abuse. You see a hatred for God. There you could look at, I know some people, you could look at them and say there is no reason that they would ever come to know Christ. The this, this deck stacked against them. But yet God reached them and gripped their heart and changed their life. And change the course of their life for all eternity. And the amazing thing is, Lord willing, they're not just the only ones changed, that God's going to use them to change generations after them. That's the power of God, the power of the God that we serve. 
And so, no matter who you are, no matter who you're looking at, because Jesus has removed the barrier between God or between us and God, the church truly is a place for all people. So let's keep reading. Um, second part of verse 14 through 18, it reads, And has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So in this passage, we see that not only did Jesus remove the barrier between people and God, but we see that the church is a place for all people because he removed the barrier between each of us. The Mosaic Law created a physical barrier between Jew and Gentile. Think about it. Circumcision is a very physical thing. And it separated those who were circumcised were God's people. And those who were not, were not. But not only were they physically separated, but the Mosaic law culturally separated Jews from Gentiles. Jewish people ate certain food, had certain traditions, and had a specific way of living that was intentionally meant to keep them separated from the surrounding nations to show that they were unique. But the law also spiritually, or you could say ceremonially, separated Jew and Gentile. Even if a Gentile wanted to worship God, they said, I know I'm not Jewish, but I'm all in. They would go to the temple and they would have to sit in this outer court. They couldn't go in and worship with God's people. They had to sit on the outside looking in. It's kind of like, and I like, if you don't know me, I love my girls, I love my family. I will always have a little girl example and illustration in my sermons. Um, and this is the one for today. Uh, you know, my two oldest, they're great girls. I'm not saying anything bad about them. But they like to play, and they play these elaborate games. And without fail, one of the younger ones will want to come join them. And the rules will be so complex and the storyline so deep that there's no way like a four-year-old can. And so what they'll do is they'll say, oh, Amy, you can hold this toy and stand on the outside and watch us. That's you playing part of our game. So while they're having all this fun, you have Amy just standing there watching from the outside looking in. That's kind of like how the Gentiles were. Even if they wanted to be part of God's people. To a certain extent, they were on the outside looking in, and it was just this reminder that you're not God's chosen people. But when Jesus came and lived the life we couldn't, but died the death we deserve and rose from the dead, he fulfilled the law. He satisfied God's justice and provided a way for salvation to a human, to a humanity that couldn't. All of what the law pointed towards, Jesus satisfied. All of what the law required of us, Jesus fulfilled. And because of that, those who have placed their faith in Jesus, us who are Christians, our differences are far less than who we are in Christ. Jesus has brought peace between us because through him we are united together as part of the family God and the people of God. I mean, look real quick at the verses that um, God, what God does through us. In verses 15 and 16, it says, by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man. That's no longer Jew and Greek. Jew or Gentile, that's Christian. And then it goes on to say, and might reconcile us to God in one body through the cross. That's the community of God, which is the church. Jesus removes the barrier that at a very deep and heart level was preventing us from living in the community of God. And removes actually a little soft. Because in verses 14 through 16, 
It says things like Jesus broke down the wall of hostility, hostility, that he abolished the law. And in probably even the strongest terms, he killed the hostility that existed between Jew and Gentile. Through faith in Jesus, there is nothing that separates you from God and other believers. And this is a reality that I haven't always appreciated, that I feel like God's really growing in my own life. Um, I have to say, over the past year, God has kind of revealed some biases I've had. If you don't know me, I'm a theology guy. Like, when people are reading novels on a beach, I have, like, an old-time, like, Reformed systematic theology cracked open. I mean, that's my relaxed reading. I just love it. It's just how God wired me. I can't help it. But with that, though, has kind of led to me where I choose to fellowship with people who think more like me. And especially those who are a little more charismatic, I'd be hesitant. And when I say charismatic, I mean, you know, those who have experienced prophecy, who have seen visions, who when they talk about the spiritual realm, it is a real and present thing to them. And their relationship with God is grounded in in their emotions. But over the past year, God has brought people in my life. And as I've got to know them, and of course I thought I was serving them, they've actually ministered to me. They have blessed me immensely. And I have really seen my love for God and my view of him grow over this past year. I feel that personally God has shown me that the beauty of this fact that in Christ the barriers that we tend to put up have been removed and that God is, which creates opportunities created by God for a greater and much richer community. So as we continue reading in verses 19 through 22, we're going to see that not only is the church a place for all people because Jesus removed the barrier between us and him, Not only is it a place for all people because the barrier between us has been removed, but we're going to see that the church is a place for all people because God himself is at work building us up together for a purpose. So Ephesians 19 through 22 says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So when you place your faith in Jesus, you're united to God. And you're united to each other for a pretty amazing thing. I mean, we see here that in Christ we're citizens of the kingdom and we're members of the household of God. And then in verse 20 and going through 22, we see that based on God's word, which Jesus being the fundamental point of it all, we're brought together by the work of the Holy Spirit to be a place that is a holy temple in the Lord. That means a place where God's glory rests and is displayed for the world around it. And not only that, and then he goes on, and a dwelling place for God. Meaning that as we're united to God and united to others and we gather to worship, God is uniquely present. I mean, how incredible is that? I mean, when you came here this morning rethinking I'm ready to be built up by God with all my other brothers and sisters in Christ to be a holy temple, to be a dwelling place. When believers come to faith in Christ and are brought together by God, they form the church. And the church isn't a building. So let me repeat that. The church is not a building. But it's the building up of us together in Christ. So when this peace with God and this peace with others is lived out, we become a people who don't just gather on Sunday, but we become a people who display God's glory, whose God is uniquely present in. 
And so that's why I think it's so tragic that Christians nowadays, so many of us, want to neglect gathering together and worshiping God. I mean, they're missing out on a fundamental part of what it means to be a Christian when they do that. <clears throat> I've heard it said this way. To say you're a Christian and not be part of the church is kind of like saying you're married but not coming home at night. Not much a relationship. A huge part of our relationship with God and our relationship with each other and how God works through our lives and into this world. It's based in the church. And kind of the cool thing you could think about is when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he says, pray, and in part he says, Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This building up of believers through uniting them to God and uniting them to each other, it brings a piece of heaven, a piece of the kingdom of God to earth. And it shows not just us, this isn't just for us, but it shows the world how beautiful and awesome God is. And that's why God's church must be a place for all people. Because it is God himself who is building up in Christ Jesus for the amazing display of his glory. So have you placed your faith in Jesus and you feel like there's no place for you here? You may be like, yeah, I'm saved, but there's, there's no place for me in this church. If that's how you're feeling, you just need to reject that as a lie from Satan. Because the truth is, God's word says there's a place for you. God's word says that he has brought you here, and by implication, not verbatim, to First Baptist Church of Golden for a purpose to be part of this building up, each and every one of you. So some of us need to maybe reevaluate how that may look, right? I know I'm not the young man I used to be. I'm not going to do a backflip. I'm not going to go powerlift even because I will just crumble in half. And how I work out now had to change, but I still get to work out. And for us as Christians in the body of Christ, how we serve, how we build up each other, the part we play may change a little bit, but it's no less important. And so if you're kind of sitting on the outside thinking, well, for whatever reason, I can't do anything. I can't serve. I'm not part of the church. That's not true. There is a part and plan and purpose for each and every one of you. So for those of you, though, who fully embrace that, I know a lot of us have been part of the church a long time. We know, yeah, there's a place for me here. I belong. When you look around and you see that person that just kind of rubs you the wrong way, do you see him or her as a fellow brother and sister in Christ called to this church by God to build it up. Do you see that person that's way different than you that would never fit into your group? And do you see them as the church is greater and better because they're here? That's a tough one because I could tolerate a lot. I could tolerate differences. It's a whole nother thing to embrace it though. But if we're going to, if we're going to be this type of church where it's said, God is doing something amazing there. God is doing something incredible in their midst. We have to embrace the work of God, not just tolerate it. That means, though, that a lot of the time, I'm going to have to trust in God's will and his purposes more than I'm going to trust in my preferences and my comfort. That's been my experience, and I'm sure that's going to, experience, going to be the experience for each and every one of us. So before I jump into application, and this is the theology part of me, I am going to go back because I skipped something. Um, 
God created this new group of people through Christ, which is called the church. That doesn't mean he's done with Israel, though. But that means that now entrance into the community of God has changed, and it's grounded in Christ. So I just wanted to make that clear before I move on. Um, so how can we respond in light of this incredible work of God? First, give your life to Jesus. And in doing so, submit yourself to his will. Jesus is where we have to start. He's the gate that we walk through to gain access to the community of God. So this work, whether it's building me up with the Father, with God, or whether it's building me up with the community of people, of the people of God, it starts with Jesus. So what I'm not saying is that if you don't believe, you're not welcome here. If you're not a believer, if you don't believe what I believe, we want you here. We desperately want you here. Get to know people. Come to class. Be a part of this church as much as you can. But what I'm saying is, is that if you want the most of your experience here, if you want to be on the ground floor of the work of God that he's doing here at the church, you have to trust your life to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And it's only when you have that peace with God and then that peace with others that you can begin to experience that. And second, for those who are Christians and part of this church, and I touched on this, but I'm just going to go a little deeper now. We need to submit to this work of God in our lives and here at the church. This means embracing the differences that we have if those differences are other than Jesus. We must be a people whose faith directs our life, not preferences, not comforts, not tendencies. That's why when I say embracing, I mean not tolerating. Because if we just tolerate, that's safe enough for me to sit back and still just do what I do, hang out with my people and neglect the greater work of what, what God is doing. But if I embrace it, if I lean into the people where we have differences, then I am an active part of the work of God that he's doing here in this church, building up First Baptist. So I want to challenge and encourage you all next Sunday when you come here, Talk to someone you don't know. Say hi to them. Put yourself out there. Pray for them. What if we were a people where on Sunday morning we would just look around and we would see people praying over other people, laying hands on people, encouraging people and building them up. People who you know, who you know, they have nothing in common except Jesus and that's all they need. So next Sunday talk to someone you don't know. Make an intentional effort to connect on some level with people who rub you the wrong way. And if you all come and just talk to me next Sunday, I'm going to take offense though. <laughs> just so you know, find a way to kind of plan that out. So, but talk to the people who may bug you, who may make you uncomfortable, who you just may not click with because you're in a different season of life. Let's put an effort, starting next Sunday, to lean into those relationships. I'm not saying be best friends. I'm not saying, like, start doing family vacations together. Nothing like that. What I'm saying is just intentionally embrace what God is doing and play a small part. If we all did that, this church would be an even greater place to be. John Frame, he's an American theologian, philosopher. He wrote, the church is the headquarters of God's kingdom, so her task is to take the gospel to all nations, to evangelize, to nurture, and to celebrate the presence of Christ. As we embrace and lean into this work of God, bringing people together who are very different 
for a purpose of being their holy temple or to be in his holy temple in the dwelling place for God, that's the type of church that's going to portray and display Christ to the community. That's the type of church. It starts with us. We want to reach people. We want God to transform lives. It starts here with us. And when we do that, we'll be a church that reaches the community and takes Christ to the ends of the earth. So let's pray. Father, this is a topic uh, that most of us, if we've grown up in the church, have heard preached dozens of times. Just ask that you, Lord, that your spirit will give this this subject just a fresh a fresh meaning to us. Help us, Lord, reveal to us where we have our biases, where we are saying, yes, entrance into the church is Jesus plus something else. And may we repent of that, Father, and then embrace the work that you're doing here. Help us to be a people, a community of God here in Golden that portrays your glory and is a place where you are uniquely present in such a way that the reality of who you are and what you've done cannot be denied. We love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for this church that you've blessed us with and the opportunity, opportunity to continue and worship you. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen.